so welcome to critical conditions the mind of nature um and i think uh, you guys because you guys are a collective you can start by introducing yourselves and then we can continue Uh, yeah. Laura, yes, no, okay. Yes. Um, so uh, we are Fragmentine. We are an artist collective. Uh, we founded six years ago in 2014. Uh, we are Marc Dubois, David Colombini, and Laura Pernou. Um, and today we're going to present our work. Um, that's one of our pieces uh, behind me. We're going to present today. Um, our work questions the impact on digital technology on everyday life by exploring for how this technology um, uh, in her, sorry, how this, this, this not, the disposition this technology have towards control and opacity. Um, uh, we talk a lot about different themes uh, that we'll instruct you today. So we talk about climate change, global warming, and different impact technology have on society. Um, I will show you a few of our inspiration. Um, so this is us, but you can also see us on Zoom. Um, so here's a few books we will we just show you because it's kind of reference we have for works and also different uh, vision of technology and nature. Uh, maybe we can also discuss that later. So, for example, we have the new dark age. Maybe you know about James Brito. Uh, we really like his work and he has a rather negative vision about technology and how it controls the society. Some, sometimes we also join this vision. We are a bit critical about technology. And then a very different vision is, for example, from Next Nature, which is a vision very um, embracing technology, like technology is our future and we should uh, completely embrace it. So that can also start a debate. Well, what would you think uh, is the future of, uh, of technology? And then another small book we like, it's the cloud seeker so it's a it was also an inspiration for many of our piece um like how to observe nature and understanding better um i will show start with a few pieces so feel free to stop at any time if you have questions about our piece um so the first one is called artificial arcadia uh, measured and adjustable landscape and it's a piece we've been developing for um the the 2019 uh, Quadriennale of Prague. So every country has to do a pavilion and this was the pavilion for Switzerland. Uh, maybe Mark or David, you wanna continue on this one? Yeah, we'll continue um, this one. So this is a huge, uh, a huge piece. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, first uh, let's look at the video, yeah. it's perfect. To Sorry, I, I showed the video first then. No, no, yeah, let's show. <laughs> Maybe you can comment on the video, like this image of glacier covered by blanket in Switzerland. I don't know if you hear about it. We can detail it later, yes. Yeah, you will detail every aspect of the piece. So this is a huge place where we uh, exhibited. So you see a lot of pavilions around also. Laura, il y avait du son sur celle-là, parce qu'on n'entend pas le son. Oui, il y a du son, mais je ne sais pas comment le partager en fait dans, dans Zoom. Ok, il n'y a pas de sharing de son, mais c'est... Oui, je ne peux pas partager le son, mais pour ce one, c'est juste comme un son d'accompagnement, il n'y a pas d'explication, donc on va plus expliquer plus tard. Yeah. Okay. So the one one aspect that we can say already in this piece that it's a piece where you can because it's a pavilion you can go inside so you can go under this blanket and it react to the presence of people so it's a project about transformations of landscape and the influence particularly the influence of people on landscape. And as you see, there is like some uh, elements really typical from Switzerland, like this uh, ski lift uh, bench or um, the shape of the fabric that is uh, evocating uh, mountains. Um, this is the first inspiration we, we 
we got for this project. Um, usually we see that this uh, Switzerland as a pristine landscape and a really nice uh, place where you see only mountains and beautiful, uh, beautiful forest. And, and in fact, in Switzerland, uh, it's more uh, than on the right. Uh, so it's really an infrastru infrastructural landscape. So we have a lot of stuff hidden in the landscape. You have like uh, um, this cliche about military stuff uh, hiding uh, inside the mountain that is not so uh, cliche, but it's uh, sometimes really true. You have a lot of uh, infrastructure to just reach the top of mountains, like uh, uh, telepheric. How do you say this in English? Ski lift, yeah. Ski lift, like, yeah, ski lift. This cabin on to go on top of, of mountains. And all of this stuff, stuff made this um, idyllic landscape not so natural anymore. So it's really a man-made uh, landscape. And so we wanted to speak a little bit about this aspect of transform, uh, landscape transformed by human and our presence. Uh, next slide. Yes. One other thing that was our inspiration is this uh, really typical Switzerland element uh, that I, I think you don't know it. It's called the Bau Profil. Uh, it shows in in English. Yeah, it's yeah, you say construction profile. So it's this like yeah. sort of stick. Uh, yeah, Mark will explain. Uh, just this uh, these sticks just enclose a, a space uh, in the city, and it to show uh, how a building will take place in the city. So it's to show how uh, the building will look like, how height it will be, and so people can oppose. To the construction, to the building of this, uh, of this house or of uh, this. Uh, so it's kind of a wireframe. You don't see yeah. there is. You see this angle, so it shows just the block of the building. Let's say if it's a, if it's a, yeah, if it's a supermarket or, and then during. So this little stick are present during I don't know two or three months, and then the, um, yeah the the neighbor. Uh, can oppose or say, oh, it's too big. It will, uh, yeah. it will cover my view on the lake, for instance. <laughs> uh, this can, or oh, maybe ecological reason. Also, we don't want this building uh, next to our farm. This kind of things. Yeah. Is this standard procedure for any sort of construction? Yes, yes. it's uh, mandatory. You have to make this. Uh, you cannot build uh, without this first. It becomes almost a polit political device. That's yeah, yeah, it's a political tool. To so we use this uh, bow profil uh, in the piece to enclose uh, some space. So we created this five by five space enclosed by this four bow profil on the corner. And it was to to raise the question about yeah what's happening in this five by five meters like now it's become a political question because of these four elements um, so this is one part a second part David told it uh, during the video um, some years ago and uh, still uh, still now it's uh, still yeah. there uh, on the Al uh, on the Rhone uh, Alp glacier. We covered uh, the glacier with blankets to avoid some melting of the glacier because it's becoming too hot, also in Switzerland. And we were really interested in this fact because we didn't cover all the glacier. We covered only some parts, like some parts that people can visit, so a touristic part. So this was uh, interesting. And also the aesthetic was uh, really interesting, this kind of blankets recreating some different shapes, so it's not nature anymore, it's not ice, it's like, yeah, fabrics, and it's uh, it's still white, but it's another kind of uh, reflection, another kind of, uh, of, yeah, of aesthetics. And so on the next slide, you see that we created these shapes with one fabric to, um, yeah, to resonate with these uh, blankets on the Alpen uh, uh, glacier. Um, maybe I, I can. Uh, yeah, you can continue a little bit about. Uh, continue a little bit. Another um, reference we had for the project was infrastructures, and there is a lot of uh, infrastructures in the Alps. For example, these huge billboards you can see. Um, so we got really inspired by this infrastructure. How does it 
um, happens in the landscape? Is it invasive? Is it sometimes also beautiful? Um, it creates a, a new aesthetic, so we really like those uh, infrastructure. And in our piece, we also added this big screen, um, which is a reference to infrastructure, but the screen also acts like sort of window on the installation. Um, I will quickly continue with the data and then talk more about the screen. Um, another inspiration for the piece was um, the way that it's not, not only happening in Switzerland, but um, really globally, we uh, really want to collect data about everything. So in, for example, in Switzerland, there's a huge process of digitalization. Um, for example, on the right, you can see, uh, this is a 3D uh, scanning of the Matterhorn the famous mountain of Switzerland that has been done by a lot of drones. So they have the exact topography of the mountain. It's kind of a digital clone. And on the left, it's, a, it's an example of a, a lake where we can see in real time the movement of the lake, the temperature and everything. So there, we've got a lot of information about the environment. And it's, it's asked another question, like um, what are these data used for? And Actually, we, we think that the combination of all this data can also make us realize the impact we have on the planet. So we think it's a good thing that we have all this information, but then, then we must do something with it, something uh, useful. Um, and in our piece, we also like to work with data. So we took um, a small uh, area of the, of the Swiss Alps. Uh, it's mainly valleys and uh, uh, grisons, I would say. Uh, it's the, the, red, uh, the red square on the picture. So we took this and we, um, we included that in our installation. So um, now on the screen, you can see uh, like a zoom part in the, the Swiss, Swiss Alps. So we call this um, fictional region artificial Arcadia. So it was, uh, we completely took the topography of the Swiss Alps, but then um, we take, um, randomly uh, one um, kilometer by one kilometer part of the, of the Swiss Alps. And then each uh, point you see on the, on the screen will give its uh, position to uh, the blanket. So then we recreate a landscape with, uh, with this blanket. Um, and uh, on the screen we show uh, exactly what happens. So yeah, you see on the right, there is a, a, a small caption, a snow level. So basically it's, can I keep going, Laura, just to... Yeah, yeah, bien sûr. Yeah. Uh, basically it's, it's literally taking a, four, a five by five piece of glacier, and then recreating artificially with a mechanical system of our installation. So this uh, profile, a uh, bow profile that Mark uh, mentioned before, they are motorized at different levels. So we can recreate different um, icy looking landscape thanks to an artificial uh, mechanical installation. And that's the first step. So that's how the system works. So it's loading a piece, uh, a real piece of data and then transforming it to a, to a landscape. And then people, uh, visitors of our installation can go underneath and their presence are tracked. So here the legend is not anymore snow level but the temperature so the heat of the people and of course it's also a metaphor of the heat of the planet and and global warming so people are going underneath this infrastructural landscape which looks like a glacier from the top from the view from the bench that you have here on the screen then people go underneath and the, as the more people there is the more the the glacier will melt so it's also like showing that suddenly these motors are going down and recreating new pieces and also affecting the map on the screen. So it's quite complex. There is a, a lot of layers of understanding. And yes, maybe Laura can keep going yeah, about I, I want to, to um, um, yeah. oh, Mark. Yeah, for, for the next, uh, the next slide is really uh, speaking for itself. If you go to the next slide, Laura. You can, here you really see now uh, all the installation that you already see in the video, but here you have everything. So you have these blanket layers that is creating a shape of mountains. On the screen you have like where this shape of mountain is coming from. And eventually if people will go underneath, 
the blanket will melt and it will um, end flat. So the mountain will go away. And we really liked these two ways also to look at the installation. So you can go below and be really under and have an influence on the shape, or you can like go on the bench and be like a tourist and just observing the really beautiful, like just mountain shape. And also you can see uh, all the data on the screen from this side. Mm. I have a question, quick question about yes. the data acquisition. So do you guys make your own data readings and then transform the data sets or are these data sets that have been you know, open source and found? Uh, in Switzerland, we have a, a really a long tradition history about uh, topography. We began to make maps and uh, data uh, of uh, Swiss mountains since a long time, first by hand, first uh, by military pe uh, people, and etc. etc. And now there is a service in Switzerland that is called Swiss Topo that is really, really uh, at the edge of uh, technology to analyze. Uh, landscape and, and some stuff and they give uh, a lot of data for for free like open source data for example you can have free data uh, of swiss landscape you can have one point of swiss uh, landscape each uh, uh, two, meters. Each two meters this is free and open source and if you buy it you can have each uh, half a meter precision so they yeah, they still have like, uh, you can have really precise data for research and scientific research, but you can also have open source data for like different stuff, like for artistic purposes or maybe also research, but not paid research, I don't know. So yes, yeah, so this data, we, we, we use this open source data and we also created our own data at the end because we keep track of every, um, every uh, visitor who came and so at the end, we had a new set of data with the snow melted. So we keep also our own uh, new transformed Switzerland. That's maybe the next slide, no? Laura? Yeah, that will be the next slide. Is, that pretty is, you, is you just Sorry. call the people snow melters? <laughs> Sorry? Sorry? I'm sorry. I just, I said, did you just call people, your visitors, snow melters? <laughs> I don't know, it just says snow melted. So no snow melters. <laughs> but, but it's it's funny words, snow melters. <laughs> no, but you it was kind of a metaphor, like if visitor came into our piece and they, they decided to stay for some time, they had an impact on the landscape. So, so yeah. Yeah. And if they wanted to experience your, our piece, they had really no choice than making the snow melt. So mm -hmm. and I don't know if uh, one of you want to explain the the map, or I do. Um, you were starting you uh, So after the so this uh, exper experience, like the the piece artificial arcada, was exhibited for ten days, and so we had a lot of visitors over the ten days. Um, but then we wanted to have something afterwards to talk about the project because it's it's really a, a huge piece, so hard to exhibit uh, again. And so we, we decided that um, with all the data we had from the 10 days, because we recorded every uh, movement in our installation and every uh, kilo, one kilometer by one kilometer um, area that was impacted by the, the visitor. So we, we created this map and it's, uh, it's quite small. So I will show you the next slide where it's a bit zoomed in. Um, you, can, you can see on the image on the left, that, for example, there is uh, squares that are missing in the mountains. So you can see, for example, uh, um, uh, that there is uh, really holes that have been created. And actually, this is all the, the part that were affected during the 10 days. So then it creates a new landscape with all the, the visitors that came into our installation. So black means, black means no snow and, no snow and white anymore. is four meters ice and snow so it's really recreating this kind of almost perfectly squared uh, melted area so it becomes a fictional map created out of the data from the from the exhibitions and from the visitors so it's kind of an object to talk about the the project so we we really get we were inspired by the maps we have in switzerland we have uh, a lot of maps that they always look the same about uh, every area of switzerland so we we kind it's of basically get like by uh, the impact that your uh, 
installation is having as the people visit you are mm -hmm. putting it on the map mm -hmm. exactly okay. it's kind of a specul speculation of of the glacier melting yeah, yeah all right very interesting and then uh on the next slide we as a kind of a new idea we wanted to do the the piece on the right but we haven't done it yet but this was an idea to kind of take one of those holes that have been really created on the map and to do it for real somewhere. So maybe it's not going to be possible to do one kilometer by one kilometer, but just like removing the snow wait, wait, somewhere, wait. like as, a, as an artistic gesture, like, a, okay, the, the and, impact and of the using impact. this political uh, device to, yeah, to raise a question about, it's about this. The happening, it's kind of a performance where we will go with, with a, how do you call it? A, a shell? No? Oh, come on, dear. Uh, the pell, you did? Shovel. Yeah. Shovel. Shovel. shovel, exactly, with a shovel and create the perfect five by five holes uh, till, the, till the, the, the earth and the grass. And also, question, you know, how, how far should we go uh, with not doing anything about climate change, basically? And again, we have this political stick that kind of asks everyone the question in a democratic way, you know. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's a non-realized non project, but that we still uh, wish to do. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, do you have a question about this piece or should we go to the, to the next one? I have one question about this piece. Where does all the snow that you take out from the square go? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> on the side, I guess. Yeah, Your probably. image we don't see. I think we just put it on the side. Maybe just doing a, I don't know, and then put it back. <laughs> we make it melt. Uh, no. Only we make a cocktail and we serve like <laughs> melted water <Yes>. to people. <laughs> Um, a melted water, yeah. Basically, give back to the people what they have created. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> and um, we we already explained a lot with the those uh, construction profiles, but we we liked uh, this political object because we think we we like to think of our piece as a spaces for discussion. Like it's always uh, raising question about. Uh, some some topics that we like and then we we also like the fact that then we can we can discuss uh, those topics with the people so the the next piece we're going to present is also um is also based on the same principle of having like a a space to to open up a, a discussion um so the next piece is called uh, displovium um it's uh, it was made also in 2019 um First, the inspiration was um, from our region. So this is the Lavo. This is like where we, we are from in, uh, in Switzerland. So it's a really nice uh, region with uh, vineyards. Vineyard, yeah. Vineyard, yeah. And, but what we, that most people don't know is that to keep the, rind, the wines growing and to avoid hail, there's a lot of people playing a magician and shooting rockets in the clouds to avoid hail. So they actually shoot really small rockets to, to, yeah, to, to break actually the, the hail in the clouds so it doesn't, it doesn't fall on the, on the grapes. And this leads us to a, a topic that we want to discuss with this next piece is the topic of geoengineering and especially uh, cloud seeding. So uh, I don't know if you already heard about cloud seeding, but it's actually this technique of sending chemicals in the clouds to um, either stop the rain or provoke it. So it's a, it's a technology that has been developed since I think the 60s. Correct me if I'm wrong, David, but I think it was the 60s. Uh, since the 40s even. 40s. In the Vietnam War and the first, the first cloud seeding use was for milit. Sadly, was for military purpose. But then it's also, as we can, as we will see with Laura, it's been used for ec economical reason, reason or for political reason. So, yes. Uh, so I will first show you the video. Sadly, I cannot have the sound, so I will just try to explain for every. Um, 
every part of the video a bit what this is about, but the video shows a bit the inspiration we, we use for the piece. So we, we selected 11 events about rain that went wrong. So either they, they did it for political reason or they did it um, because they wanted the, the uh, uh, how do you say? Um, more water for the plants. Yeah, more water for the plants or like a lot of different reasons. Let's go. So, brief rainfall episodes of varying in. So the first uh, event is from London. So we mix actually in our piece a natural rain event with artificial ones. Um, so we created um, a pool uh, where you can see rain, and it's actually. Um, goes from natural rain to artificial rain. So we, rec we recreated the rain pattern. And when it's um, a natural rain, then it actually looks like it's natural. But then when it talks, the piece talks about an artificial rain, then it starts to make a geometrical pattern or something that looks a bit odd and not uh, natural anymore. I think the best is to see the video on our website because here it's a bit lagging <laughs> because of Zoom. But uh, oh, yeah. if you go to our website, uh, you can you can watch it. And mm -hmm. Maybe I, if it's if it's lagging, maybe I just uh, keep on with the presentation, and then uh, you will. Yeah, there is some other small loops, so you will see. I, I just go to the next slide. Um, so that's we we made two versions of the piece. So we made a, a one that is oval and made with a cortem steel. Uh, the, the border and it allows to do a certain kind of, uh, of patterns and then we make also another one that is um, uh, a bit uh, smaller round and made with uh, alpine style. Uh, we exhibited these at different places um, and also the installation comes with uh, two screens as you have seen briefly on the on the video that shows the uh, geoengineering event that we have been talking about. So on, I, I don't know if it's lagging, uh, if you can see the video, but here it shows like- Yeah, we can see it. Uh, yeah, it shows like a different type of rain. So it's first the natural one, and then it's, uh, it's one that is uh, engineered. So it's kind of reinterpretation of those rains, even how they would have looked like. If, can you tell the difference between a natural rain and a rain that has been geoengineered? Here you can see a bit the, the screen. So each time it's just a, a zoom in uh, and zoom out from a, a places on earth. And then on the, on the left, you can have the explanation about, so it's research that we've done. So we, we made the information as we, we found them, but it's always a text describing what happened there and why it was, um, why it was caused and how it went wrong, etc. So it's like uh, giving you a few, uh, insights about uh, geoengineering events. For the next, next slide, I can um, just explain you one of these events. Mm -hmm. um, if you put like the, this yep. one, this one is a uh, rain that is falling by two drops at the same time. Um, but the pattern is random, but it's always two drops at the same. And this, this was to explain, for example, um, uh, a rain event that happened in uh, Ouagadougou because we have, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, cotton uh, cotton fields and cotton fields need a lot of water and so they made so much cotton fields that at some point there was no water anymore so they tried to make uh, to make rain over this cotton field so they used these uh, rockets to provoke rain and in fact the effect was it worked so much that it was drowning all the fields and it destroyed all the cotton fields because there was too much water and the ground was too dry and so because it was too dry the water stayed and so it was um, like a fluid and so to represent this we choose to create this uh, rain that falls by two so to say okay it's falling too much rain so it's uh, and so we try to create some kind of uh, contemplative part in the pool where you have like a strange rain and a data part on the screen as in, in artificial Arcadia because we like to have a 
like a, a part of the piece that is contemplative and another one that is more ex more to explain to people on the screen. The, the next image, uh, Mark, you will continue? Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah, the next image is uh, where the name uh, is coming from and why we choose also uh, to, to call it like this. Uh, this is a Roman atrium, a Romanian atrium. And it was um, the first room you found in Roman house uh, where the rich family uh, welcomed uh, the people to come to their house. Normally they couldn't go elsewhere. It was a public part of the house and it's called um, an atrium. And in the middle of this atrium, you have this pool. And normally on the roof, you have a hole uh, called uh, a displuvium. And this, uh, this hole uh, allow rain to fall inside this, this uh, pool. So we found interesting to call it like this because yeah, first it's a pool where rain is falling, but also it's, it was the space where people came to discuss and to, to meet. So again, um, like with the Bau profile, uh, it's again a place where we, we try to gather people around to discuss a topic about, uh, about yeah, rain for this, uh, for this piece. So it's again a political space discussion. This is a exhibition view, but it also kind of looks like the Roman uh, atrium. So I'd like to put both uh, next to another. So uh, do you have any question about the, this piece or should we continue? Maybe for this one also to, to mention what was our artistic uh, position regarding cloud seeding? Maybe that's also interesting. Uh, of course, we don't say it's bad or it's good, but what we wanted to reveal is also uh, cloud seeding in itself is not really bad for the environment uh, in terms of the, the chemical. Uh, it doesn't really affect the flora or um, from what for, from the research we have done, it's it's a too small amount to really have a let's say a bad impact on 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 nature. But what is bad is the snowball effect. Uh, I give you an example. The, the example Mark mentioned is like okay, we we want to solve a problem with technology, but at the end uh, it creates a new problem which is even worse. So a flood, for instance, because the the soil was super dry and then suddenly it started raining a lot and then it destroyed the cotton fields. There is a lot of this even, for instance, in, in China, they wanted to lower the pollution of Beijing because when it's raining, it's also uh, lowering the, the PM, the fine particle of pollution in the city. So they wanted to, to do this in, in Beijing. And instead of uh, raining, it started to snow and the full city was paralyzing uh, because of the snow in, in Beijing in 2008. So that's one of the events. So what we want also to, to show is this fail and also the side effect of using mm -hmm. such technology and what, what the side effect is having on the general uh, ecosystem. Yes. And um, I can add one more, more theory that is quite frightening about those technologies, also how they can be used because uh, they've been used for for purpose such as um, avoiding rain on military parades. So, I mean, that's not really harmful. It's like, oh, they want a sunny day for the parade. So, okay, that's it. That's, that can be considered okay. That was done by the Russian. But then some countries now, we know that they want to kind of prevent the rain, the clouds to go further than the border so they can keep the water in their country. So they, they can have this cloud seeding infrastructure at the border. And so they can make the rain kind of fall in their country yeah. instead of going to the yeah. neighboring country. So kind of stealing the water even before it's uh, falling in the, into the ground. So kind of the same that has been done with like taking the water from the river upstream and prevent it from going uh, further. But this is something also that could be done with those technologies. So. Is this technology really available or people like citizen scientists are building by themselves these rockets? How are they getting their hands on these? I think it's quite, uh, it's quite legally structured and it depends really on the country. Even in the United States, they have different law 
uh, for different states. So some states can use it really like, uh, of course, it's quite a lot of cost. Uh, they use it in Colorado to create more snow for the ski resort, for instance. So it becomes also really a, an economical uh, tool, let's say. But I think, uh, of co- I don't think people can just do it like this because it's expensive. And of course, there is regulation of the amount they can s- s- send in the air, etc. But there are things that we don't know. You know, if it's military purpose, it's always a bit dark. <laughs> so I don't know. And you uh, mentioned about these events that where the ray of the cloud seeding was used for uh, other purposes that were like for military purposes. So uh, those events were like these researchers, how they were uh, accumulated, like they were just working as a back end for your project or they were also a visual uh, space for those uh, readings. Um, you, you mean, uh... How did we do the research or? Uh, no, how the, uh, those events like the, um, you mentioned about the military uh, use of cloud seeding. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, then the, uh, the uh, this pond space that you have with uh, the ripples, like as a viewer when we are entering in the space, mm-hmm. we get to know about it just by looking at the uh, ripples that are forming in the, on the layer because it uh, was not very visible in the video yeah sorry it's uh, i i explained bl- briefly but it's uh, we have the two screens on top of the installation and on those screens we uh so one by one it's switched from one event to another so i think every two minutes it's it's another event that is uh, mentioned and then on the screen it's displayed the information about what happened so it's synchronizing. Uh, it's synchronizing mm-hmm. the pool and the, the information on the screen. Mm-hmm. And, yes. and it's a loop of 15 minutes and maybe 12 events and 12 different patterns on the, on the atrium. And, and usually at first people walk in and they, I mean, they really see the pool first because it's really um, contemplative and it's really uh, also calming to look at mm-hmm. those patterns. And, and then I, at some point you, if you want to know more, you can go and look at the screens and then you will kind of understand what this piece is about and um, the research we've been doing uh, for, for making this piece uh, happen. Very interesting. Um, how, much, how much time do we have? Because I'm not sure we have time for... Uh, so I think 4.45, we'll, uh, we have some questions and we'll ask you those questions. Uh, but we can continue till then, yeah. And so uh, sorry because we don't we have, have the time. same time here. So uh, oh, sorry, sorry. I'm so sorry. Immediately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So around I, I, uh, 15, 15 minutes. We have 20, we have 20 minutes. Okay. Okay. okay uh, great. Okay. So I, I go to the next uh, project. Yes. Yeah, we can just to about just ah. to so to yeah. see the so just know? a glimpse of the no the just a glimpse of the technical part without <laughs> ah, the order. <laughs> of the of the displusion like it's it's the grids that permit us to create this rain so just to show under the water this is a trick uh, to create the rain it coming from down and not from up small small pumps just just creating a small flow and creating the drop but yeah just a glimpse <laughs> a bit uh, behind the scenes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The Maybe next, one? the next uh, image. It's also I can talk about it briefly, but it's a. Uh, it looks like it's fake, but it's an actual cloud. Um, that it's called a lenticular cloud. Uh, so it's kind of. Le- I we like to put this image after the the explanation of this program because it's a bit like we want to control nature, but sometimes it's just like perfectly controlled by itself, and it does stuff that we thought would be completely artificial, but. It's not. <laughs> okay, I go to the next project. Uh, your phone needs to cool down. David, tu voulais parler? Uh, yes, yes, now we will. Uh, so the, the two previous projects are, mowing, uh, are showing how um, technology can impact nature. And on this, pro- as this next project, we're looking at how nature or climate change can affect technology. So it be, it's a bit, we always look at 
climate change from a human perspective or sometimes from a plant or animal perspective, but most of the time it's from our, our human uh, perspective. And here we are thinking how an iPhone will fare uh, global warming in, in 20 years. So I don't know if you, you probably all have one, one day an iPhone and you go to the beach or in India it's, it's pretty hot and humid in, in some of your region. Uh, and, and then you, you leave your, your phone uh, on the beach and suddenly you have this bug occurring, temperature, iPhone needs to cool down before you can use it. I don't know if you, you, you had this issue once, uh, but then you, you have to put your phone um, elsewhere and then maybe 10 minutes it's cooling down and then you can again use the screen. So we were very, very interesting by this bug because in, in most of Middle East country in, in 20 years or even in 10 years, for, and the bug, sorry, the bug is occurring at 45 degrees. So in most of Middle East country in 10 years, uh, in summer, it will be the normal uh, temperature uh, in the middle of the day. So most of our, our, our technological device will, will not work. Um, so it's a bit an absurd way, so maybe next slide. Uh, so what we create, it's an installation where uh, looking like a terrarium, so a terrarium is a, is a place where you put um, uh, iguans, for instance, or such a reptile, reptile, yes. And it's an artificial climate that you create for the animals, right? Uh, it's people that keep animals at their place and they recreate these kind of tropical climates that for instance in Switzerland we don't have, so we have to recreate it um, artificially. So here there is a, an iPhone uh, or a phone in our case, uh, suspended in the middle of this terrarium. And we have these two artificial lights. The so one is uh, the, the purple one is mimicking uh, um, a tropical night of 20 degrees, uh, a full moon tropical night. And the other one um, is uh, heating at f uh, 55 degrees. So we're kind of recreating the bug uh, artificially of the iPhone needs to cool down before you can use it. <laughs> so it's a cycle. Uh, maybe a uh, next slide, Laura. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it's all about it. detail. Maybe we can talk, it about, uh, talk about it later, but it mm -hmm. was like, yeah, it's some details about how could uh, a phone... Um, how, how to say how, how survive survive in this uh, in this um, in this overheating climate? So they, they have this kind of phone protection that you can buy on uh, on online for protecting your phone from from cold or from hot temperatures. It becomes really almost like a gadget. Uh, and uh, if you go back to the previous slide, Laura, you see yes. that there is another phone and and with these two cover uh, at the bottom of the. <laughs> of the, the glass box. Uh, maybe you can see some details later. Yeah, here it's a bit better uh, to explain. So there is these two uh, cycles, different cycles. So one is heating up to 55 degrees, so very warm with this uh, red light. And when it reach 45 degrees, the, I, the, the phone recreating the bug, so here it's written your phone is overheating, close the current application to help your phone cooling down. So this, we managed to really hack the phone <laughs> and to recreate that bug. And then when it reach uh, on the bottom right, you see that there is the global temperature of the environment. So we have a temperature sensor. And when it reach 45 or 48 degrees, I think it's switching down to the other light. So it's cooling down. So it's an infinite loop of uh, uh, heating up the phone, then it bugs, and then cooling down. And then in, when it reaches again 25 degrees, so the general temperature of the room, then it, it starts to warm up again with the red light. So it's kind of this, <laughs> this uh, absurd loop. And what is the phone doing uh, during that moment? The phone, when it's not too hot, when it's too hot, it's stop working. And when it's not too hot, it's looking online for his own survival. So he's looking of how, as a phone, I can start to, to, to low down my temperature. <laughs> so it's like different videos and maybe you can see the video, Laura, so we can understand. Uh, next slide. So this is an installation in Vienna and this oh. is the video. Yeah. Sorry, I cannot put the sound again, but... Uh... 
Oh, you can see nice. that. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know how to put the sound uh, in Zoom, so. Maybe, maybe if you take from your speaker, we'll be able to hear it. Yes. No. Uh, yeah, no, but it, we also... Uh, it works now. Can you hear something? Yeah. So now it's warming. And now it's switched to the other one. Watching a YouTube video, <laughs> the phone, uh, does it like, is it like looking, searching for information while it's heating up, you're saying? Mm -hmm. Laura, should we send the link to the video, to our website in the chat? I think that's better. All right, All right. yes, we can. So can you do it? Your question, uh, the, the, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I was asking that how does it search for information, the phone, to so survive? Current, yeah, currently it's a video pre-recorded. But in the future, we want to just more create like a small algorithm that is looking for different tags or currently it's pre-recorded video. Yes, because it was with the time oh. we had, it was more, let's say, simple to do it like this. But we have the skills to do it uh, um, differently, more dynamically. Uh, that would be also interesting to do. But yes. And the video is, for instance, uh, looking to buy online this cover, you know, <laughs> or is looking for, uh, there is like video of, um, of uh, oh, uh, the climate okay. activist, uh, Greta. Greta Thunberg, yes. Mm -hmm. so he's looking for a video of Greta and this, in this kind of things. <laughs> uh, All right, great. So the visitors can sometimes look and see what happens on the screen and sometimes you see that it's just bug and yes. <laughs> It's okay. almost as if you're treating the phone as an organism by itself. Like, you know, exactly. exposing yes. it to like different cycles of heating and cooling. It has a consciousness of itself where he's looking for answers, trying to copy <laughs> what's going on. Like, it's also got its little own like space suit going on. <laughs> that space suit is so cool. <laughs> but at the same time, phone. it's very absurd. But at the same time, phone has become so important for yeah, us. Yeah. That is, is really... A metaphor of us being overheat and then you know yes yes <laughs> but like that's the kind of tell of the age we're living in right like we're sort of blurring the boundaries between like what is virtual what is real we're so embedded in these things right now like i've been seeing a lot of videos of everything being cake on on the in, on the internet at the moment there's absurd things going on or our soundscapes are modified by technology now we can't differentiate between synthetic sounds and real sounds as well so i think this sort of narrative is sort of embedded in our lives already we just haven't been you know taking the time out to shift our perspective on it. sure <laughs> uh, at first for the this piece we also wanted people to put their own uh, smartphone in the installation but then in the end we decided to do it with, with the smartphone that we uh, we actually uh, use now but the first idea was that people had to put their own uh, device in the installation and then kind of watch it suffer and <laughs> like what does that is it I mean, taking phones from people is so difficult <laughs> just uh, that would be quite a challenge can you give us your phone as part of the experiment <laughs> yeah, it's better because when we tried this installation we broke the phone of laura a little bit and an now the phone that is no, one yeah the <laughs> iphone is like the screen was burned uh, and this phone that is still inside the installation when it's working now it's blinking all the time because it's becoming to be broken completely. <laughs> so yeah, it's better to not use the phone. Of yeah, we <laughs> uh, so yeah. guys, we are like almost uh, uh, like we're pretty much uh, at the end, and uh, we have uh, we have a few few questions uh, if you want to answer. <laughs> uh, Farah, Ritika, do you have questions?
art uh, it's a land art biennale in uh, in in the again in the swiss alps <laughs> and uh, here the inspiration in switzerland we have these pyramids uh, that were used to um, to calculate the, the geography in the 60s. Uh, here you see one on the left. So this is something you can find in some Swiss summit. And now they, they just use as a goal for height, for instance. And if you go back to the first image, um, we had the idea to recreate a contemporary replica of it uh, with another inspiration, which is this uh, uh, space, uh, sort of space chip. <laughs> So it's kind of a mix of something, uh, an old inspiration that we found in the mountains and something more, um, yeah, technological, let's say. Uh, yeah, we can s show the video if you want. But uh, yeah, in two worlds, what, what we do is a, is a digital observatory. So we, it's a VR <laughs> installation that is at 2,500 meter high. <laughs> and what you see in the, in the VR uh, Google is let's say an augmented landscape. So we 3D scan the landscape around us. And yeah, here we go. <laughs> That's the view you have more or less in the, in the headset. So you see the similar perspective, but then the, the landscape is a, a point cloud of, of the reality. And what we show is again, the infrastructural landscape. So on the antennas, the electromagnetic waves, the key you see, all the antennas, how they are connected around us. So let's say all these intangible infrastructure that we tend to forget when we are in a, in a, in a beauty in nature, natural landscape, let's say. And here we reveal it uh, thanks to the, the um, virtual reality experience. Uh, yes, here you see that the landscape is transformed by the, by the signal of 5G and 4G around in the region <laughs> so it becomes like we take uh yeah we take this data and transform the landscape and we do the same with the um, the weather uh, so the the observatory it's called n1 observatory is recording weather data and this data also affecting what you see here the wind uh, are affecting the the landscape you see uh, the mountainous landscape you see around around you so this was uh, installed the whole summer and now we disinstall it and we hope to re-exhibit it uh, elsewhere. <laughs> uh, yes, I think that's... Yeah, that's you should definitely ex do something like this in India. We have like the Himalayas, the biggest mountain range. <laughs> that would be <Yeah>. nice. <laughs> but I don't know how much technology you'll find there because it's completely barren. <laughs> hmm. Maybe, maybe we'll find some new, who knows? <laughs> <But there's laughs> <always> <laughs> Thank you so Thank much you. guys. I'm going to close this room now. So bye bye guys. Yeah.